Hi, my name's Tom Neely. I've been a long time engineer for analytical graphics. I've been working on Aviator for, for a very long time. So in SD, part of SDK 12, we changed the way the math works uh, under the hood. And uh, the general name for that effort we came up with was just Aviator High and Fast. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about what that entails. So uh, agenda-wise, uh, we have a couple things to, uh, to show you. I want to show you a, a neat little video. Um, then we're going to talk about the, the new math for the high and fast capability. Um, we're also going to uh, show, we're, we're going to demonstrate a ballistic missile scenario that shows um, what happens um, between the uh, prior generations of Aviator and the SDK-12 uh, version of Aviator. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about some Lambert guidance applications. So we have this uh, neat little video of a hypersonic vehicle. Um, and we're going to go ahead and fire that video off. And I'd like to bring your attention up in the top left corner of the screen. You can see a total temperature value. That basically tells you it uses the combination of the Mach number and the atmospherics to, uh, to tell you uh, what would happen? What would the, what the temperature would be at the at a pointy end, if you will, on that uh, vehicle? If the air is slowed all the way down as it would be at the pointy end of that vehicle, that's how hot that air is going to be at that uh, at that situation. Uh, it sort of represents a maximum potential temperature that the vehicle would encounter. And then we're also showing you not only the offensive uh, hacksaw flight path, but we also showed you a couple defensive maneuvers that you can model inside SDK there. Okay, so one of the big things we did for SDK 12 and Aviator was to uh, upgrade the mathematics or the, the uh, modeling used inside the, the product. And I, I call that fourth generation. Um, that doesn't really mean too much to people, but uh, Aviator over its existence has gone through four very major changes, if you will. Uh, to get to where it, it has gotten. Um, that should be an indication to customers that we pay attention to, to those kinds of, of uh, needs of our customers. And um, you know, it basically averages out to a, a generation every four years or so. Um, so previous generations, uh, they made use of a flat earth constant gravity model and they didn't pay attention to Coriolis effects. Um, and if you know, if you do your research in the modeling of uh, aerospace vehicles, most people say that that kind of model is pretty good unless you're modeling things like satellites or really high speed like ballistic missiles and things of that nature. And our modeling was, it, it, was, very, it was very high fidelity, even for uh, things like SR-71s and, uh, you know, and F-22s launching missiles, our, our modeling was, was very good. Um, but we do have many customers these days that are going into hypersonics um, and want to use Aviator on either end of uh, orbital operations. So that meant that we wanted to, uh, to, to improve the math to make our tools more useful for our customers. Um, we have two basic types of procedures inside Aviator. One are what we call basic maneuvers and those are built, um, there it's akin to a flight simulator kind of paradigm where you're actually, you're actually doing sixth off, or now you're doing sixth off um, simulation. Um, and, and we have these constructs called strategies, which means you don't have to use stick and throttle to, uh, to get the maneuver. Instead, you define the, the, uh, the accelerations via a GUI for that strategy. Things like do a barrel roll or fly some kind of missile guidance um, uh, trajectory, if you will. So uh, we upgraded the way those, those vehicles or those procedures operate. And then we also have the, what I'll call the standard procedures, and those are what I'll call the click, click, click procedures where you can, where you can define a flight path, be it a hold, an arc, uh, um, a takeoff, a land, fly in route, to do those kinds of things. And those, those kind of procedures are defined to have a given trajectory that's relative to the Earth. And then what the software does is it once it knows how the vehicle's supposed to, it, once it knows its flight path in the earth frame, it's able to back out what that means in terms of the accelerations that the vehicle has to be able to perform or is performing at every point along its trajectory. Um, 
and uh, there's an equation that captures this difference between the body frame and the ECF frame, and the, and the difference is basically the acceleration of gravi due to gravity and the acceleration that's due to Coriolis. Um, and standard procedures, what they do is they're built, they're built in this ECF frame to have a given trajectory. And so now with the software, and that's, that's exactly what they used to do in SDK 11 and earlier, uh, in, in earlier versions. But what we do, what the difference now between 11 and 12 is that we have a higher fidelity versions of the gravity and Coriolis terms. And so what happens is, is uh, you know, that's part of the reporting that, S that Aviator gives you. It'll tell you what your load factor is, for instance, at any point along the flight path. Um, so that becomes a function of your ECF frame that you've, that's been defined along with the gravity and the Coriolis terms. And the gravity and Coriolis terms can be constructed if you know the position and if you know the velocity of the vehicle. That tells you what those terms are. And so that's something that you define in your ECF frame. You know what those values are, and then that tells you what your body frame uh, forces and accelerations are. Uh, basic maneuvers are, are almost the complete opposite of that in that they, they are defined essentially in the body frame. Um, and then since we know the gravity and Coriolis terms, that tells us what our total ECF accelerations are. Um, and there's some, uh, you know, if you, if you read this, you can see some fine print there um, on what to expect if you're moving from SDK 11 to SDK 12. In a nutshell, uh, Aviator, we are, an, we are an aviation or an aer aeronautical application. So in terms of maintaining backwards and forwards compatibility, our focus was on maintaining the, those aeronautical aspects, meaning things like airspeeds. Um, so if you're, if, you're, if you're loading an old scenario or creating a new scenario, um, the, uh, you should expect essentially the same airspeed behavior. But then because of the way the math is different, you know, we're not operating on a flat earth anymore. We're operating on an, a round or an oblate earth. Uh, straight lines in flat earth are now, um, are now Archimedean spirals in the new model. So, you know, numbers are going to change. Uh, and the numbers that we decided to, to maintain as invariant as we could were the airspeed numbers. That gives you an idea of what to expect there. Also, you'll be interested to know what the limits are on, on the software. And um, there, are, there are limits within calculations, and then there are limits on the user interface entries that a user can make. The limits on the user interface entries are 7 kilometers per second for speed and 1,000 kilometers for altitude. You can set up problems, or you can set up procedures that can go substantially higher and faster than that. Um, say you have a rocket motor that's boosting a vehicle, uh, you can start that vehicle out at a high and fast altitude and then you can go even higher and faster um, based, on that, uh, based on that rocket motor, for instance. But we have to draw the line someplace. I mean, SDK, we don't want to infringe on things like SDK Astrogator. Uh, they have their own, uh, that, that's a phenomenal tool with phenomenal accuracy and fidelity. We have no intention of using Aviator to do what Astrogator does and vice versa. So, so there needs to be a sort of a dividing line. And the software enables you to start with an Aviator vehicle, launch it, cut it up into orbit, and then transition to Astrogator or some other v orbital operation. And then that plays out and eventually you might come back to Earth and then you can then reattach an Aviator object and then re-enter and perform maneuvers inside the atmosphere. Um, so this, so, the, so you now have a, a, a flexible, accurate tool that can take you from um, Cape Canaveral out to Mars, and then back to Splashdown in the Pacific Ocean, for instance, all in one software, all in one scenario. Um, it is interesting to know that if you take that seven kilometers per second and a thousand kilometers altitude, if you were to put an aircraft at that straightened level flight condition. Um, you would be experiencing a force of gravity relative to sea level of about 0.38 Gs. Um, that doesn't mean that aviator vehicles can't go less than 0.38 Gs. You can fly zero Gs just fine. Um, but that just gives you an, an impression on, quote, how orbital you can get if you're just at that, soup, at that altitude and limit through the, through the uh, graphical user interface. Um, also, it's interesting to note that based on these limits in the GUI, um, you can model a Mach number that's greater than 20 at any altitude that's less than 350,000 feet. 
Now, there isn't much air at 350,000 feet. So the fact that the air temperature increases rapidly above that altitude, that would then cause your Mach number to drop. Um, in general, that's an altitude that the stagnation temperature at a vehicle might be very high at that altitude, but there's such little air density that the heat that is gen the heat that's actually generated on the vehicle is not really all that high. So now I'm going to show you a long-range ballistic missile example that sort of puts into a scenario what I just was talking about. So here's a here's a uh, ballistic missile scenario, and it's intended to show you the difference between SDK-11 and SDK-12 in Aviator and how it models ballistic trajectories and how it fits into this uh, high accuracy, high and fast world. Um, we've got this scenario and we have three, we have three vehicles. Uh, there's a benchmark missile and that is a, uh, that's an SDK missile object and um, it's flying pretty far. Um, that is a high and fast long ranged uh, trajectory. Um, and in SDK-11, this is using, we, we brought in an external ephemeris, in SDK-11, if we initialize this SDK-11 aviator object at, at uh, some point on this missile, in other words, launch off of the uh, benchmark object, we get the white flight path. And this shows you what happens when you apply a flat earth constant gravity model to this high and fast domain. Obviously, um, it's not flying all that, uh, there's not a whole lot of similarity there in those flight paths, even though they started at the exact same position, velocity, and acceleration state. Um, the reason why it's so, it's so much shorter ranged is that since you're using a constant force of acceleration, constant force of gravity on this vehicle, you can, you can think of that force is pulling the vehicle down towards the ground. Um, and what's really going to happen if it's, a, if it's truly a, a ballistic missile, the force of gravity is going to be decreasing and then you also have a centripetal acceleration effect. You know, it's the force that holds you against the, uh, the rotor wall um, that's, you know, you have a centrifugal force that's trying to push against that force of gravity. So that's why the benchmark vehicle flies as it does. And if you just use a constant force of gravity that doesn't reflect that, that those, you know, the accuracy of that of the physics there, um, you get the white you get the white flight path. Now, if uh, you go to SDK 12 and the Aviator High and Fast features, you see that you get something that uh, is, is fairly satisfying. Um, and as the developer of this software, I'm especially satisfied uh, because there are two completely different ways of doing these calculations at work here. The, um, the benchmark uh, is, is flying in inertial coordinates using Kepler's laws. The SDK-12 aviator um, object is using the basic maneuver six DOF oblate rotating earth dynamic model. Um, two totally different things, um, but as you see here, when you do when you do things the aviator way, you're still getting, you know, very close. They're not exact, but they're very very close, and they're not exact because of all the differences between the two models, basically. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you on that. Okay, now I want to talk to you just a little bit about one of the uh, features one of the new features of SDK-12 that was built specifically to take advantage of this high and fast uh, way of doing things. Uh, and it, it's the Lambert guidance strategy that's a basic maneuver thing. In this particular screenshot, I'm actually going to animate this a little bit and we'll just sort of let this fly as I talk. The purple vehicle is a long range, I'll call it a quasi-ballistic trajectory. Um, the thing about a Lambert flight path is it, it essentially it figures out how to fly to a predicted point and it figures out your velocity vector that you would need so that if you were at that velocity vector you would not need to make any more maneuvers. You could essentially fly a zero G trajectory from that point to hit the predicted point. So what we do in SDK 12 Aviator 
is we put that algorithm into a guidance loop and then we're able to react to maneuvering targets. And so this particular scenario shows a uh, bogey down there and the bogey's going uh, pretty darn fast. Uh, it might be seven kilometers per second. And then he makes a sudden turn. Where he makes that sudden turn, he, the uh, purple trajectory of the, um, of the offensive weapon makes an adjustment. Okay, so you can sort of see how that plays out. We also are modeling two defensive missiles, and they also are using the Lambert guidance trajectory to project ahead to a predicted intercept on the purple target. And you can see as it flies, and then there's this yellow trajectory here. The, the blue trajectory isn't affected at all by the offensive purple vehicles maneuver because it gets there early. And you can see by its shape, it's also flying uh, essentially a zero G trajectory. That once, it, once it launches and gets into the, it sort of gets going in the right direction, it uses the Lambert guidance methodology to predict an intercept and fly to that point. The yellow vehicle does the exact same thing. It launches later than the blue object and then the purple vehicle executes its maneuver to follow the bogey and it turns out that you would, if you set the maneuver constraints on the interceptor, it doesn't have enough maneuverability to, uh, to follow the purple vehicle. So thanks for your attention. Uh, it's always fun to, uh, to talk about these kinds of things. Um, you can let us know um, how, things, uh, how things work. Thank you.